Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Twisted Tale Studio channel, coming to you live from my couch where I have been here under quarantine for what feels like 30 freaking years at this point. Seriously, guys, send help. Ontario has just been under constant lockdown since, like, Christmas pretty well, and I think I'm going a little insane. If there's one thing I'm really coming to realize going into the second summer of COVID is all the shit that I really took for granted. Things like going out for beers with my coworkers, going to a patio or any sort of restaurant for that matter, uh, going to a movie theater and watching new releases that people in the States can go see, but I can't. I'm looking at you, Quiet Place Part 2. But thinking about it, if there's one thing that I actually realize I don't miss all that much, it's theme parks. Yeah, I live reasonably close to Canada's Wonderland, which for all my American friends is like one of two major theme parks in Canada that I can even think of off the top of my head, honestly. When I think of Canadian theme parks, there is Canada's Wonderland, and then there's the theme park in uh, the Edmonton Mall, and that's about it. I have been to Disneyland in Florida like once as a kid, and that was great as like a novelty, but honestly, there's a cat yowling upstairs. Yes. Yes, Kitty, what is wrong? Are there ghosts on the stairs? Are you protecting us from the ghosts on the stairs? He's just staring at me from the landing. I don't know, I don't know what's going on. But yeah, what was I saying before I got interrupted by a cat? Uh, oh yeah. So I've been to like Disneyland in Florida like once as a kid, which is great as a novelty, but again, post COVID times, just the thought of going to a theme park and just how disgusting and dirty they are. I'm not sure I could do them again, to be completely honest. I That's one thing I could just cut out of my life and nothing of value would be lost. But I am doing a series of summer themed reads right now. So um, yeah, a horror book taking place in a theme park, which is a major part of most of our childhood summers growing up, seems to fit the bill. So. Today, we are going to be talking about Fantastic Land by Mike Bakovin. And for anybody who is new here, I will break down how this is going to work. First, we are going to start off with a little bit of publication history and information about the author. Then I'm going to go into a spoiler-free summary of the book for anybody who hasn't read this book yet. At which point I will give you guys plenty of warning when we are going to get into spoiler territory. So at that point, you're going to want to pause the video if you haven't read it. Go pick up the book, read it, come back. I'll still be here when you come back, I promise. So without further ado, let's visit Fantastic Land, where fun is guaranteed. So our information on publication and author is actually going to be pretty short and sweet this time around. His bio on his website is like, two short paragraphs, so it's pretty concise and to the point. He lives in Nebraska with his family. They have two kids. They have a dog because you always have to mention the dog. Everybody wants to know about the family dog. Fantastic Land was his debut novel and it was published in the fall of 2016, which he later followed up with his second novel called Pack, which was released two years later in 2018. Both of his books were published by Skyhorse Publishing, and yeah, that's about it. Like I said, there's not a whole lot going on on his website, and his Goodreads is actually pretty bare bones as well. It looks like he's kind of active on Facebook and Twitter for anybody who is interested in whatever he's up to. That looks like the place to check out his most recent news. So uh, yeah, I guess uh, on with the synopsis of the book. The story of Fantastic Land goes thusly. I guess first off, I'm gonna start off by saying that this book is written in the style of a reporter compiling a whole bunch of interviews. Think uh, World War Z, Max Brooks, de-evolution, uh, that sort of thing. It's not uh, just straight told from one character's perspective. The story is told collectively by several employees who have worked at the park that have been interviewed by this fictional author. So since the 1970s, Fantastic Land has toted itself as 
the place where fun is guaranteed in Florida, and that's assuming that you don't count Disneyland or Universal, I guess. Anyway, Fantastic Land is located in a kind of a northern area of Florida. The creator of the park itself really wanted a place close to the coast so that when you're in the park itself, you can look in one direction and see the ocean and you can look in the other direction and see just untouched forest. Absolutely spectacular design, spared no expense. The park itself, like Disneyland, is kind of sectioned off into a bunch of themed parks. So you've got your main entrance, which is the Golden Road that leads to this giant ex exclamation point. Exclamation point. Say that 10 times fast. Uh, in the center of the park, that's huge. You can see it from pretty where, pretty where, everywhere. Yes, pretty where, everywhere in the park. So a lot of people use that to navigate. Uh, you've got your fairy prairie, which is your kids section with all the little kid rides and the pixies. And it's like an enchanted forest sort of thing. Uh, you've got the superhero section of the park. Then there's the pirate cove next to that. They've also got a future world, which I guess is kind of like Epcot at Disneyland. And then there is a circus section. So like there's a bunch of different distinct parks within Fantastic Land. Now, right from the very beginning, because they were located on the coast, everyone knows hurricanes are a thing. So the owners built bunkers and underground tunnels. Again, a lot like Disneyland in that sense, where the employees can get around the park without needing to walk through all the crowds, but also to double as storm shelters in the event of a natural disaster. Years and years go by without the need to use any of these emergency facilities, and over time they kind of get a little bit loosey-goosey with the training on what to do in the event of a serious hurricane. So then, of course, a major hurricane called Hurricane Sadie starts developing off the coast of Florida. It picks up speed and power in a matter of hours. Like, I think they said it went from, like, zero to full-blown, like, Category 4 or whatever hurricane. I forget how they're categorized. Sorry, I don't live in Florida. Quite clearly, I don't know a whole lot about how hurricanes work. But um, it goes from being a tropical storm to being a full-blown hurricane in like the span of seven or eight hours. And then it doesn't follow the normal route of most hurricanes where it hits the more southern parts of the state. It goes straight up north where there are fewer safety precautions set up and the Coast Guard isn't laying in wait there waiting to see what happens. So this whole situation ends up being a perfect storm for just a shit show. Yeah, okay, I know, that wasn't funny. I'll show myself out, it's okay. Anyway, back to Fantastic Land itself. So another one of the contingency plans that they put in place at this park was to protect the park and its assets from vandalism and looting. So the plan was that you get a whole bunch of volunteers who stay in the bunkers and ride out the storm and then they just kind of hang out at the park until emergency services arrive. They're given plenty of space, plenty of food, plenty of water, everything that they would really need to ride out a serious natural disaster. Because apparently literally paying a whole bunch of kids by the hour to sit in a park for potentially days to, I think they were expecting maybe a week at most, costs less than what it would pay the insurance. Welcome to corporate America, everybody. So what we end up with in this book is a, around 300 or so people, mostly college kids or kids just straight out of high school. So think people in like the 18 to 22 age range being in this park with very minimal supervision. And of course, being a horror novel, things do go wrong. You know that right from the beginning that this ended up being a big to do, a big tragedy that made the park look real bad. So the entire book is spent putting together the pieces from various perspectives to get a better idea of what really happened inside the park between when the storm hit and when the emergency services came to rescue all of these kids 
about, I think it, they said it was five or six weeks later. Okay, so I think that's about as much as I can really explain about this book before I get into spoiler territory. So I will say right here is the place where you get off the ride. If you do not want spoilers for this book, if what I've described sounds like something you would like to read, go out and buy it, read it, come back. I will still be here when you get back, I promise. So without further ado, let's talk spoilers. First, I'm going to start off by reminding you once again that this entire book takes place in the span of about five to six weeks, give or take. They're a little bit vague on the numbers at times, but keep that number in your mind, just over a month in your mind when I talk about the events of this book and how quick this stuff goes down. So the skeleton crew of about 300-ish people ride out their first few days in the park inside the bunker itself, just waiting for the hurricane to blow itself out. Uh, eventually, the hurricane knocks out the power, I think, after a couple of days. So that causes a whole tizzy to do. People panic because they're stuck inside a bunker and it's pitch black and nobody knows what's going on. And right from the beginning of like, the one dude that, that was left that was management is kind of being a dick and being a little bit incompetent. So people don't really trust him. To his credit, he manages to get the door open and let some light in for people so they calm the F down. Uh, they manage to get the generators up and running. Uh, but basically within the first day, just from that panic that happened, a couple of people did end up dying. There was one kid, I think they said, uh, suffocated because he couldn't get to his asthma medication. And then another girl who was bludgeoned to death and it was suspected that it was the manager guy who was like one of the first employee interviews that you hear. He insists that he didn't do it, but he honestly doesn't even really seem to know what happened and just nobody from that point on trusts this guy who is apparently supposed to be rallying the troops. So, okay, whatever. They're not off to a great start, but what happened was genuinely just an accident. Everybody gets outside. It's still rainy and shitty weather, but everyone's feeling a little bit better not being cooped up down inside basically a concrete bomb shelter, for lack of a better word. A bunch of them just start goofing off. One dude ends up climbing up on one of the buildings saying, I'm Batman, and then falls off because he climbed on a roof of a gift shop or something in the rain and it's slippery. So he falls off and he hurts himself quite seriously. He hits his head and like, I'm talking like bleeding out his ears seriously. And there's no doctors on site. There's like two girls who know first aid, but quite obviously when you're at the point where you're bleeding out your ears, you're a little bit beyond first aid. So everyone's standing around and it's been like a couple of minutes. They're trying to figure out what to do. They're freaking out. And then there's one guy from the Pirate Cove, who's one of the Pirate Cove actors, picks up, I think he, they said it was like a stanchion or something. It's one of those things where like the velvet ropes to show you where to stand in line, like those things with the heavy ass bases. He comes up and he mercy kills this poor injured dude by bludgeoning his head in with a stanchion and then walks off towards the pirate cove. That dude ends up being the leader of the pirates, which is one of the uh, several tribes that ends up forming. That's actually the catalyst for why they end up splitting up into the various groups or tribes as they're known as later. Uh, so there's several groups. Obviously, most people gravitate towards where they worked in the park when it was open. Uh, so you've got the shop girls who were the girls who worked in the entrance area where all the gift shops were and the Golden Road. Uh, they basically rally together because they need something to do, something to occupy themselves while they're waiting for rescue. They just need something to keep them from freaking out. So they end up basically over-policing the gift shops. If anybody tries to go in and steal stuff, they would chase them off quite violently. 
they later end up being known as like the archers of the park because for some reason a theme park in Florida sells functional bows and arrows, like hunting bows and arrows with metal tips because reasons, because I don't know, you apparently you need functional weapons to be able to buy while you're on vacation with your kids. Okay, who else is there? Um, there's the fairy prairie people who are either referred to as the pixies or the fairies, depending on which interview you're in. They kind of end up being like a non-thing after the first week. They're so disassembled and disorganized that the other groups just kind of pick them apart, mainly the pirates. But yeah, they end up scattering more or less after a while. So they end up just being kind of irrelevant after the first little bit. Another group that ends up forming are the mole men who are mainly comprised of like the older employees who are like the engineers and the maintenance people, basically the people who keep the park running. They are the people in the park who are not college age. They want nothing to do with what's happening with all the tribes, so they spend most of their time hiding in the tunnels and just avoiding everything as much as possible. They're also one of the only groups that tries to send people to go for help and escape the park because basically one half of the park is completely flooded out. They can't escape that way. And then a couple of guys try going out in the direction of the woods, but they don't end up making it either. And it's suggested that like, one of them is murdered outright when he gets back. So yeah, those are the mole men. Uh, who else do we have? There's the robots who are the employees of the future world. And then there are the Deadpools, which are the employees that worked in the superhero section. They got their name because there's apparently like a giant Deadpool statue in one of their gift shops. So they named themselves after Deadpool from Marvel. And then we have the freaks which actually are my favorite tribe of this whole book. I love them. So they're the circus performers. They're uh, all the oddballs and they're mostly like performers and artists and stuff like that. They go back to the circus where because this whole book takes place in like September, right before they're about to do all their Halloween stuff, they've got access to all the props. So for the first half of the book, you think that there are a bunch of psychopaths like stringing up bodies and dismembered body parts all over the front of the circus tent. But when you actually go in, it's just a bunch of Halloween decorations. So they're very much not the bad guys that you think they're gonna be at the very beginning of the book. In fact, they're mostly just sitting in the circus tent getting high the entire time. And when, rescue eventually does come around the leader of the freaks is just like it's about time guys like come on we were almost at a weed it hands down my favorite group of the entire book they were hilarious uh and then lastly we have the pirates who suck they are the bad guys basically of the book there are times when they try and make you feel a little bit more sympathetic towards them but honestly, like they're the ones that are constantly harassing all of the other groups. They're the shit disturbers. None of the stuff that happens in this book would really have happened if the pirates weren't acting like pirates the whole time. A lot of what happens in this book is the rest of the employees reacting to the pirates. So yeah, the pirates suck. You are without doubt the worst pirate I've ever heard of. But you have heard of me. Oh yeah, and there was, I guess they're not really a group. I think there's like two of them, but there's a couple of employees running around in like pig or warthog masks that aren't really associated with any group, but they're kind of like acting super freaky and suspicious. And later you find out that they're actually murdering people in the hotel. So like, they're not a tribe, they're kind of their own thing, but um, those characters are like the definitively evil characters for the majority of the book, even though they don't really appear all that often. So yeah, that's my description of the groups within the park. Now, again, keep in mind, like 
these groups have begun to form within days, like not even like half a week, I would say, of the initial landfall of the hurricane. And almost immediately from their inception, the Deadpools and the pirates are 100% at each other's throats. Like if there's any group that could be said to be like mortal enemies because the Deadpools and the pirates are right next to each other, they just, they hate each other from the start. A Deadpool accidentally wanders into the pirate cove really early on and he walks into one of their gift shops. So as punishment, the leader of the pirates drags him back in front of the Deadpool's hideout and chops off his hands. Yeah, so we've gone from zero to Lord of the Flies in a matter of days. They're not fighting over resources. They say repeatedly that there are no issues with resources in this park. Everyone has more than enough food. Everyone has more than enough water, although I guess water gets a little bit dicey a little bit later, but that's like weeks in. Like at this point, it's not a matter of survival, it's just a matter of pettiness. So from this point on, everything just keeps on escalating and escalating and escalating. As we jump from interview to interview, we're talking with at least one person from every crew and getting their side of the story, which can basically be summarized down to like, I did what I needed to, to survive, mainly because the pirates kept coming in and trying to take all of our shit. And again, the pirates are not hurting for resources. They are fine. They are just being assholes. So this goes on for literally weeks until at one point, the manager who was supposed to be rallying the troops, who, um, if I might quote my stepdad here, ended up being as useless as tits on a boar. What can I say? My stepdad has the soul of a poet. He sends out a message to all of the various leaders of the different tribe, and he's trying to put together like a council of peace, a summit where they can all sit and talk like rational human beings. So they all turn up, they all agree that they're gonna go into this with no weapons, they're gonna go and it's just gonna be talking and I will give you three guesses as to who breaks this agreement first and the first two guesses don't count. So the pirates, as it turned out, showed up early and hid a functional cannon underneath the table where all of the leaders were sitting and they set it off in the middle of the meeting, basically blowing half of the leaders of the various tribes to smithereens. And like on the same note as the bows and arrows, why does a theme park have a functional cannon with gunpowder? in a children's theme park. Like for a park that was constantly touting like, we are all about customer and employee safety, they sure as heck had a lot of stuff around that was incredibly unsafe. That whole event ends up going from being called the Council of Peace to the Council of Pieces, with an IE, obviously. Uh, the bodies are strung up in the middle of the park, which is just lovely. They're also not among the first bodies to be strung up. The pirates have been doing that for ages. So yeah, everything is completely hell in a handbasket at this point. Once again, the mole men, who are the only ones who seem to have any semblance of, like, thoughts in their brains about trying to get rescued, decide that they need to get some sort of signal to the outside world to let everyone know that they're not okay because by this point they really should have been rescued. Little did they know that because the CEOs thought that they set up their employees so well, the CEOs have been telling the Coast Guard and rescue services, you don't need to worry about Fantastic Land, they're fine. Go ahead and help all of these harder hit small towns on the coast that also really need your help. Our employees will last a little while if you don't get to them right away. Really spectacular, spared no expense. Which is part of the reason why they ended up stuck in this park for a month. Thanks guys. So yeah, the mole men are the ones who are thinking it's like, how do we signal that we need help? They decide that the one really good way that they can make a statement is to blow up the exclamation point in the middle of the park because apparently this park also has legitimate dynamite, 
which they don't weigh correctly or measure correctly and nearly blow themselves to smithereens yet again. But they do end up knocking over the exclamation point, which does prompt rescue services to take another look via satellite imaging. And they see the bodies and everyone's just like, oh shit, what's happening? Uh, Houston, we have a problem. Um, maybe people should go check out what's going on at this park. So as messy as it was, the Mole Man's plan worked. Uh, the Coast Guard and National Guard and everyone comes in like SWAT team style, prepared to make arrests if needed. Everyone's rescued. Uh, they don't really put up much of a fuss uh, when the actual authorities show up and start escorting them all out. And um, everything kind of winds down after that. Like you've got your final interviews with all of the rescue servicemen who went in and described exactly what they found. Uh, there's one final interview with uh, the leader of the pirates who um, was apparently the brother of the kid who suffocated at the very beginning, but he doesn't seem to be very stable even before that, so it seems like his brother dying was just kind of that one straw that broke the camel's back that turned him into a total sociopath. There's kind of suggestions that the pirates, although they insist that there wasn't any um, assault of a gender-based nature, uh, there's some hints that they were potentially cannibals. They had food. They had food. There was no reason to eat your co-workers. G I've worked with people I haven't liked before, and I can pretty confidently say that if I was locked in a theme park with them, I would not feel any sort of compulsion to eat them. So yeah, that's fantastic land, everybody. So what are my final thoughts on the book? Um, well, the one major thought that kept reoccurring while I was listening to this, I listened to the audiobook version, was that this book is really, really trying to justify why things went from like zero to 60 inside the bunker and then 60 to the stratosphere the minute that all these people leave the bunker. The book repeatedly cites that like, hey, these are young people. These are like 18 to like young 20 year olds. They're used to constant stimulation from their phones and social media and like, you know, all of the very boomer-esque descriptions of a young person these days. Now, I'm a little bit removed from this age group myself at this point, like I'm not in my early 20s anymore. But even I can fairly confidently say that if I took the phone away from an 18 year old and stuck them in a theme park, that I'm not gonna immediately expect them to turn around and murder their coworker. Like it was to the point where I was really, really wondering about the author's age, which I went and tried to look up, but there really isn't much information on exactly how old he is. But um, the Yahoo email address and his contact info maybe kind of gives me a general idea of the age that I'm thinking of here, but like, damn man, like, you, you really don't have a high opinion of kids these days, do ya? I might have even forgiven the constant kids these days mentality if it wasn't just constantly alluding to Lord of the Flies. Like, am I the only one that picked up on that? That he was really trying to go for a Lord of the Flies theme thing? Especially with like the murderers who were wearing the pig masks? Anyway, um, good things. Things I liked about this book. Uh, cause there's things to like about every book. Uh, it was pretty well written. I have no complaints about how it was written. It can be really difficult to write a book like this where you're talking in so many different voices. You can't really get into the groove of talking like this one kid who worked in the fairy prairie or this one guy who worked as a pirate. Uh, you're constantly, as the author, trying to switch between different narratives. And I feel like the author pulled that off fairly well. And especially, again, I listened to the audiobook version. The voice actors would change their cadence and their accent depending on who they were depicting. 
it was very clearly always the same two voice actors one man one woman but um they did a good job making me buy that they were all these different people within the narrative so i enjoyed that quite a lot i also really enjoyed just how biased every character was now this goes without saying that like when something goes wrong and you're hearing two sides of the same story the truth is usually somewhere in the middle well in this book you're hearing it from like 20 different people so you hear one story and they're obviously biased they're obviously trying to make themselves out to not be the bad guy or they're trying to just justify their actions and what they did which is fine but obviously super biased version of the story well then you hear the next person and how they tell it and like the subtle differences all come out and you kind of can suss out exactly what the reality of the situation probably was. And the reality of the situation is the pirates are the causes of all life's problems. Like seriously, towards the end of the book, they had an interview with one of the guys, not the leader, uh, although he does get interviewed as well as I mentioned, but one of the kids who was in the pirate uh, cove section, yeah, we're not that bad. We were not as bad as everyone makes us out to be. Everyone kind of painted us as the villains. Like, no, no, you, you were the villains. You were picking on everyone else when you had literally no reason to. You decided that you would go in and take whatever you wanted and you pushed that as far as you would go until people began to push back and that's when things got ugly. Sorry, I am just super salty about the pirates in this. I hate them, which I suppose is good because you're supposed to not like them, but oh, I, I hate them so much. Every single one of those pirates deserved a jail sentence of some variety, some more than others, depending on to what extent they participated. But if you end up in a cult, you do not get a free pass if you end up maiming or killing somebody just because your cult leader told you it was okay. You can tell me that you had a code of ethics all you want. It does not justify what they did. Oh, okay, okay, okay. I'll, uh, seriously, I'll stop now. I will go on to my final rating of the book. Uh, so my final rating of the book, I originally rated this as a four out of five on Goodreads, but then I ended up bumping it back to like a three because it's a fun story. Three is at the point where it's like, I enjoyed it. Uh, it was a good read, uh, but I have gripes. Quite clearly, I have gripes. And also just because I was looking at the other four star books I have on my reading list from this year, and I just couldn't justify putting it on the same level as a bunch of the other four star books that I liked. So um, unfortunately, it got a post bump down. But for any of you who really like Max Brooks and World War Z and De-Evolution, you'll probably really like Fantastic Land. It was very, very similar. In fact, I had to double check uh, by Googling it to make sure that it wasn't just the same author. So yeah, for anybody who enjoys those books in particular, uh, this is definitely one that you, I think, will enjoy reading. And now, really quick before all of you scatter to the winds to join me next time, I want to give a quick shout out to a good friend of mine who is very active over on Twitch. Uh, his channel is Professor Morph Plays. He is a variety streamer and we do a bunch of collaborations together. Uh, as of this recording, we are about to do his six month anniversary stream. And then I'm hoping we will have this video up before he does his next cooking stream of which I am usually the taste tester, so if y'all want to see me suffer, that's one to tune in to. I will put his information in the void above my hand and down in the description below for anybody who wants to check out his stuff. And also, I am also a very tiny YouTube channel, so it helps me out quite a lot if you hit that thumbs up button down below. And if you really are enjoying my content so far, you can hit that subscribe button as well. And last but not least, a word from our sponsors, me and my Redbubble account. For those of you who are new here, I have a Redbubble shop where I post new designs weekly. This week's design 
is this which future me will put in this void above my hand. I'm sure it'll be awesome. It always is, in my opinion. So that is all for me today. I will see you guys in the next video. Bye! Bye.